been invited by the Pera Museum and by Osal Bay especially for having requested that I present this um, exhibition on Nicolas Murai. It's an interesting subject which I hope you will appreciate. Um, could you turn the lights out because I can't, uh, I can't work like this. This one in my face is very difficult. You can lower it or... Um, I guess you can't. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's much better. Thank you. Um, some hundred years ago, in a, in a, from an old forgotten trunk, there's an old yellow envelope. This old yellow envelope has a writing on the front that says September 1913. Oops, excuse me. September 1913. Inside the envelope, there's a negative no positive. When the negative is developed, a photograph appears of a young man leaning against a post on a beach in front of a boat. It reads prosperity. The young man is 21 and he's wiry, tightly, bound, tightly wound, looking at the spectator who we don't know who he is, with a strong look in his eye. Handsome young, young boyish looks the handsome looks that for the next 52 years are going to be seducing people, going to be opening doors for him and keeping him inside to do some of the most extraordinary work done in, in the field of photography for the next 50 years. This man is Nicolas Murai. Could this be his first self-portrait? It appears to be so. He arrived in the United States in August of 1913 from his native Hungary. Hungary. This is an important photograph for many reasons. First of all, because it's the first self-portrait made and that he made after his arrival. Second, because it explains to us exactly how his creative process developed. By the time that he arrived in the United States in 1921, oops, sorry, thank you. By the time that he arrived in the United States in, 19, in 1913, um, his style was already made up. He probably was walking down the beach when he saw this uh, boat and it read prosperity. He knew exactly what it meant. He came to the United States with the idea that he was going to become famous, he was going to become prosperous, which was the opposite of where he came from. He saw the boat, placed himself behind it, and took a photograph. Voila, there was his future. Interestingly, he took the photograph, or rather the negative, he kept it in an envelope, not wanting to tell anybody about it, put it away to be discovered a hundred years later. The story of Nicolas Mira begins in Zeged, Hungary, in, uh, in February of 1892. Uh, he comes from a rather unassuming middle-class Jewish family. His father is a postal employee, mother is a homemaker. In front of you, you see on your left, you see his brother Steve, then you will see Nick, then you will see his, his, um, his brother Arthur in the end, and then you will see in next between them his brother William. To one side in the oval, you see his sister Margit. This was an interesting story. Samu, his father, uh, registered him in the Jewish registration, uh, in the book of registration in the synagogue. Uh, he, but he would not give him a Jewish name. He, name, he named him, uh, he was named originally Miklos Mandel, which in Hebrew, in Jewish, means almond tree. Instead, he changed his name to the Magyar name, uh, Miklos Murai, which meant coming from the river Murai. The reason why he wanted to change the name, and he requested a change of name from, uh, from the government, was because he, it was a rising anti-Semitism. He was concerned about it. He wanted to move to Budapest so his children would have a better opportunity at uh, a finer education. Um, and because of, uh, in Budapest, the rising anti-Semitism was going to be interfering. Uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire under the effect of Karl Luger, the um, mayor of Vienna, uh, who was um, a rabid anti-Semite. He referred to Budapest for its high uh, population of Jews as Judapest. Uh, little did he understand, meaning Samu, when he moved to 
Budapest that life would be much more difficult than in uh, in Zeged. Uh, yes, it's true the children would be able to get a better education. However, um, life would be much more difficult for him as well as for them. Uh, he really wanted the children, particularly Nick, to study to become a lawyer. He thought Nick would uh, land a um, a bureaucratic job, which Nick eventually hated. He wanted the freedom that he eventually caught and decided um, and decided then to leave Hungary. But before that, Nick attended very good schools that Budapest had to offer until he was 12. But something had changed from the time that he moved from Zeged, which is he began to notice that people singled him out because of his, he was Jewish. And uh, on his 12th year, he was physically beaten and humiliated, repeatedly slapped by a teacher who humiliated him for his religion. At that point, he decided to go truant, to leave the school and not to go back. But he didn't tell anyone at home. As he walked the streets of, um, as he walked the streets of, um, of Budapest, he came upon Sal Santelli. Sal Santelli uh, was, uh, was um, placed by George Santelli, who had been invited by the government of the Austro-Hungarian Empire to establish a fencing a school. At that time, upper classes and aristocrats studied fencing, and of course there was still, um, there was still uh, duels being carried on. It was important that if you grew up to be a to be uh, an aristocrat, you need to know how to fence. Uh, Nick uh, heard the, the sound of laughter, he heard the, heard the sound of swords, and he began to peek into the, into the holes on the door, and he began to notice how these were fencing. It's interesting, and it's an important connection to make, that while he was angry, resenting his teacher for having mistreated him, uh, simmering in his anger, was how he discovered fencing. It's an important thing because uh, he's, the first thing he learned about fencing was that the best defense is an offense. And, um, and he went back and gradually he decided that he would become a fencer as he got older. He noticed several things about fencing, that they danced, in a fencing dance, and they also they needed extreme discipline. They needed extreme discipline in order to become uh, fencers, and he liked that. Uh, he would have liked to attend the classes. Unfortunately, he could not. He'd never held 10 kronen in his hand to help him uh, attend them. He'd all only had five, but he promised himself that one day, not only he would become a fencer, but also he would leave Hungary and he would see all the paintings in the world. Nicholas Murai, uh, when his father found out that he was truant from school, decided to uh, punish him. He said, uh, you're not good enough to be a bureaucrat, therefore I'm going to punish you by putting you into art school. And uh, he said, that's exactly what you deserve. Little did he know that that was exactly what Nicholas Murai wanted. He, he went into art school, he put him as an apprentice as a, to an engraver who taught him several things that he would cling on to for the rest of his life. One of them, he taught him how to draw, he taught him composition, he taught him um, how to uh, do sculpture modeling from, from the body. He learned the appreciation of the beauty of the body and also, more importantly, he taught him the difference between seeing and looking. These things Nicholas Mira took with him, and as you will see later on in his photography, uh, several things stand out. One of them, of course, is that his photographs, especially the black and white ones, uh, appear to be sculptures, and the color ones appear to be composed like paintings. <coughs> Nicholas Murai decided after two years of apprenticeship, he would work for Weinrum, and he worked for them for two years, and he learned uh, photo engraving, he learned how to do printmaking, and then he decided that he would go to Germany, because in Germany he would learn um, what he needed to know about, um, about printing. Uh, at that time, Germany was considered the most important place where one could learn about printing. In Germany was Ullstein Publishers. Ullstein Publishers were the most important publishers in Europe. At the time of the Anschluss, um, uh, Ullstein had over 10,000 employees and over 3,000 regular um, 
um, people who, who bought uh, their books and their magazines. Ulstein also was a forerunner of, um, of advertising. Uh, Nick couldn't wait to get there. Uh, interestingly so, during the time that he was apprenticing, he was on weekends going to museums, looking at art, and he was finally accepted at Ulstein. For him, arriving at Ulstein was like arriving at Mecca and being accepted. There was no higher gift for him than arriving at Ulstein. There he stayed for four years, for two years, excuse me, and was exposed to the work of the four brothers, each one of them uh, who stood out for different reasons. And uh, one of the first things that he learned at Ulstein was um, um, how to sell. Advertising was very important. Ulstein had learned their advertising skills from a Dutch American who had written a book about advertising. His name was Edward Bach. And in the book he specifically said, you never want to sell shoe polish, you want to sell shiny shoes. So if you, sell, if you sell the shiny shoes, people will buy the shoe polish. You don't want to sell a refrigerator. You want to sell um, fresh food. You don't want to sell a beautiful dress. Instead, you present a beautiful woman, and so on. All of these things Nick incorporated, Nick admired. At some point, he decided, I think I'm going to go to the United States to see why the Ulstein brothers are so fascinated with American advertising. Um, he said, I have nothing to lose, I have everything to gain. And, um, and one of the things that the uh, Ulstein brothers admired the most about the United States was Curtis Publications, which were the publishers of Ladies Home Journal. And Nick studied those magazines and he said, I'm going to find out exactly what it is that um, what it is that Americans do. And um, of course having no money at all, very little savings, he contacted a, a cousin of his in Switzerland. His name was Miklos Magyar. <coughs> Miklos paid for the, uh, for the ship fare for him to come to the United States second class and Nick arrived on a August of 1913 on a sunny day he was fascinated by the beauty of the skyline he arrived with uh, $25 in his pocket all the money that he had earned and saved and with the 50 word vocabulary in English which he was sure he would not need because he had an Esperanto dictionary he was rather fluent in Esperanto and at that time it was believed that Esperanto would be the universal language and of course he always wanted to be ahead of its time one of the things that concerned him, of course, was right away getting a job. But in the process, while he had been in Germany, he had earned an international engraver's uh, certificate. With that certificate, he could get a job anywhere in the world, wherever he went. So the following Monday, he went to the International Engraver's uh, Association, walked in, and uh, in no time at all, found a job. Uh, he was horrified to find out that he needed to pay $250 in order to, to sign up. But he was relieved to find out that uh, $10 would be enough and that he could pay out the rest as he worked. It was difficult to find a job, 1913. That year, about 400 immigrants came from Eastern Europe to the United States. Nick was one of them trying to seek fortune. Uh, many of them were hoping that they would come to the United States and uh, make some money and return. Uh, Nick did not have an interest in returning. Nick was actually escaping from, from um, military service. He had left. Um, he had left for Germany shortly before he turned 18. He had refused to do military service. His father confronted him, and he said, "I don't want to be in the army of a country that hates me." And then his father warned him by 1913, and he said, "You better come back because they're going to catch up with you, and when they do, you will go straight to prison." And Nick said, "Well, my choice is prison or America. Um, I have a good choice." So he came to America. In America, he found a job in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, working for Mr. Stockinger. Later, he found out that Stockinger uh, the, was the most important printing company in the area, but also it was considered a doghouse. Everybody was fired right and left. Mr. Stockinger was horrible, mean and screaming, demanding, a perfectionist, but he loved Nick. Why did he love Nick? Both had had a similar training, both in Germany, and Nick was a perfectionist himself, also a 
terribly angry whenever he did not get his perfection. So they got along famously. Mr. Stockinger originally paid $14 a day, uh, a week, but after he saw the work that Nick was doing, he paid him $27.50. It was an incredible, an incredible amount of money. Nick was very happy. Uh, the most important thing for Nick, though, was to blend in. He did not want to appear as a foreigner. He took English lessons, he went to night class, he wanted to learn English without an accent, he was scared of standing out, he wanted to be an American more than anything, but uh, he was a person in the end and he was lonely. So who did he go to to meet his needs? He went to the Hungarian enclave in New York City between Lexington and 51, and there he met the Hungarian friends and eventually fell in love. He fell in love with his future wife, Ilona Fulop. Ilona Fulop was this handsome woman. Nick was weak, fell madly in love, courted her, eventually fall in, uh, fell in love. Ilona had a power unto herself. She was outspoken. A letter of hers to the New York Times reprimanding the Times for their news exists today, in which she's informing them that their news about uh, how Hungary entered the war were wrong and they needed to correct themselves. Nick loved her. He, this was a sign, of course, that he would always be interested in strong, powerful women. And she was going to be the first of several wives. You see her here, uh, Nick looking at her adoringly. She, of course, is looking at the camera. Um, she was the editor for the Hungarian Miners uh, uh, Journal. And, and at some point she decided, of course they were relatively poor, they rented a one-room apartment, uh, wallpapered in black and white, uh, decorated with photographs, and at one point she convinced him, she said, if you move to Chicago you will make more money, it will be easier for us to live. Nick, of course, wanted to make things work and moved to Chicago. The photograph that you see on your right is, Chicago, is Nick uh, in the studio where he worked in Chicago. He hated the job. He finally found a job in a studio where he was photographing uh, babies and christenings and maids who arrived with their boyfriends on the weekend and passerbys and he felt he was not being stimulated. He went to the, again to the engravers uh, uh, to the engravers unit and found a job doing engraving work. The owner of the studio hated to let him, let him go because everything he did was perfect, but Nick wanted to be challenged and at the studio he was not. One of the great things that happened to him, however, in, um, in Chicago was that opposite the studio were the Turnvereins, and this was a studio, um, exercise studio, where people were taught physical culture as well as spiritual education. And Nick decided to join them, and one day while he was doing physical um, uh, calisthenics, he heard the, f um, the familiar laughter and, uh, and sound of swords fighting. And that's where he discovered fencing, and he became the fencer that he would turn out to be. Uh, until the end of his life, Nick uh, was a fencer above all. When you would ask him, he would um, diminish his work as a photographer, but he always was proud of being a fencer, and he would say, when I die, when I die with a sword in my hand. Um, uh, in Chicago, he earned his first gold medal, and then uh, sometime in 1919, he went back to New York, and to, he would see Ilona regularly, and he said, I'd like to come back. And she said, no, I want you to stay in Chicago. You're making better money. And he said, no, but I want to come back here. I want to be with you. Anyway, they argued, and then he discovered the reason why she wanted him to leave is because she had a lover. So it was a bad thing, but it was a good thing. It was a bad thing that he went to Chicago, but it was a good thing because he became a fencer. It was a bad thing he went to Chicago because he got a divorce, but it was a good thing because, of course, uh, he was able to be free. He arrives in New York in 1919, and he decides to find a job. He walks down Fifth Avenue, going to the major studios. There he uh, visits an old friend, Pierre McDonald. Pierre McDonald was a photographer who was famous for doing portraits of men. He visits Pierre, he says, what am I going to do? And shows in some of his photographs, and Pierre says, you know, I don't think you can get a job with the photographs that you make. Uh, 
He said they are too different from what people want. You need to adapt to the needs of the studio. Uh, either you adapt or you're going to need to open up a studio on your own. And of course, adapting was not Nick's way. Nick's way was for others to adapt to his needs. So he decided to take the challenge and he rented half time a studio from um, Gertrude Payne Whitney. Miss Whitney was the, was the person who eventually would be uh, the originator of the Whitney Museum of Art in New York City. Um, he photographed her. He photographed her standing in front of one of her major sculptures. And she was fascinated by his work. Uh, he photographed, he met Bernice Abbott and met many of the celebrities who would eventually become celebrities by then. Uh, at that time, they were not. They were simply inhabitants of the <coughs> Greenwich Village, which was the place where the intellectuals inhabited. Um, um, by 1920, he decided to open up his own studio. And the photographs that you see in front of you, on your left, you see Nick sitting in his studio shortly after I opened it up. And on the left, of course, you see the photograph of the studio in itself. He rented um, in the cul-de-sac on 129 McDougall Street. He rented a three-story uh, building. On the first story, he rented it to a sculpture friend. On the second story, he lived, which was a room and a bathroom. And on the top floor, as you see here, is where he opened his studio. And since he had no money to speak of, he was glad to have the skylight, which he covered with, um, with black velvet curtains, which he could move at will. And that way, he could photograph uh, people under the effect of daylight. He had only two light bulbs in the studio. He kept only one on and the other one off until the, until the doorbell rang. If you notice, the element of sculpture remains to be seen. In the self-portrait, next to him you see a candlelight and you will notice that the candlestick is actually in the shape of Brancusi's um, uh, endless column. And in the studio you will see their sculpture over the fireplace. Um, and also behind his desk. Um, it was very important and on a table, of course, right in the forefront of the painting. Uh, among the photographs that are on the wall, uh, one is a self-portrait. Let me... This is a self-portrait. And then there are five done of Ilona Fulop. This is Ilona. This is Ilona. This is Ilona. This one is two. And so is this one. I've not been able to identify the other ones. Um, I've looked, but I haven't been able to see them. Here, of course, you see sculpture, another sculpture, another sculpture, another sculpture. And you see here the endless column of Brancusi's. Nicholas Mira was uh, famous as well as infamous for having a temper, for, but also for being a perfectionist. And he was able to manage to do both. One of the things that he had learned before arriving in America was that if you said to people the right thing, you could win them over. And if you could win them over, they loved you. And if they loved you, you could get anything you want to from them. And so Nick became a professional seducer, which is what one sees in his photographs. Outside of a studio was a photograph of Ilona Fulop. And um, uh, it said, it said, Nicholas Mira, portrait tour, in a way of saying, if you want to look like this, come to Nicholas Mira, and I will make you look as beautiful as I've made this woman look. Nick was in the studio for several weeks without getting anybody to come in. And then um, one day, uh, Gertrude Payne Whitney said to him, well, let me, let me do a show of your work. Give me some of your photographs. She gave him a small exhibition. And because of that exhibition, Mr. Henry Sell from, from um, Harper's Bazaar saw it, fell in love, and he said, um, call this man, send him to my office, and have him bring me as many photographs as he wants for me to see. He sees the photographs and immediately sends him Florence Reed. Florence Reed was at the time the top actress in Hollywood. Nick had not photographed anyone before, and he said, um, he was very frightened. And she said, why are you frightened? You're a photographer. You're taking my picture. I'm a, I'm a Broadway actress. I do my acting. You know, Let's just work together. And that's it. He made his photographs. And after he photographed, this is a photograph that actually made him famous overnight. It was photographed 
it was reproduced in Harper's Bazaar, and um, overnight people began to come. People wanted to be photographed by Nick. She not only loved the photographs that Nick had made of her, but she also loved him. She hugged him, she kissed him, she immediately saw him as a friend, introduced him to her actor's friends, and uh, began to send people to him. Henry Sale saw the, fo the effect the photograph had and said, I will give you a contract and I will pay you $50 per photograph. Needless to say, it appeared to be Nick was on his way, and he was. The contract that he appreciated the most was a contract that he made uh, with uh, Condé Nast. Uh, Mr. Crowninshield, who was the editor and publisher of Condé Nast, saw the photograph of Miss Reed and immediately contacted Nick. He was most grateful. At that time, photography, even though in Europe it was seen as the new art, in the United States it was not considered as such. Although, um, Condé Nast had several photographers who worked for them. People like James Habe, Man Ray, um, um, uh, um, uh, just lost, uh, James Habe, um, uh, Cecil Beaton, uh, Baron de Meyer, fell in love with the work and he said photography is art. So he began doing uh, um, photographs of um, photographs of, um, um, of fashion models which had not been done until then. Nick Murat was hired. Uh, before the decade was over, Nick would be doing over 350 photographs for Condé Nast, for Vogue, whether it was fashion, celebrities, personalities. He photographed everything and everyone, from pea soup to presidents. He photographed four presidents, did the formal portraits for them, uh, Roosevelt, um, uh, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, um, Eisenhower. But what interested Nick the most was that he had access at people he would not have access otherwise. He, for example, he was able to photograph uh, the Isadorables who danced for Isadora Duncan, as you see on the left. And on your right, you see the girls who danced for the Helen Muller School. Um, he was interested in the dance for many reasons. On, for, on the one hand, of course, because it looked like sculpture. It looked like sculpture in movement. And uh, again, he was able to create, it was of course the time of Art Nouveau, and the girls are photographed such as with the flowing lines. And he's able to, he meets, he meets them personally and is able to photograph two Serbian girls, sisters that you see on your left, Desha and Leia. And there were, uh, um, there were sisters, Leia was a younger one, Desha was also a model for sculptor. She was the model for Harriet Frischmann. There's a major sculpture of, by Frischmuth called The Vine, which today is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was Frischmuth's uh, sole model between 1921 and 1931. Um, the photograph that you see on your right is one from a series that he did for the January issue of Vanity Fair. And Vanity Fair, even though it was on the cutting edge, and it was a, a magazine that published people who nobody was publishing before, like uh, Joyce and Proust, for example, or H.G. Wells, uh, was also f f producing, uh, showing uh, paintings by Picasso, by Matisse, and of course photography. Uh, but they would not show nudes. Nevertheless, Nick was always cutting edge, and he decided to do a photograph of, of, um, of Desha for them, in which he's pretty much covered with, uh, with gauze. This one is from the same sitting, but I decided to show this to you because she looks, she looks like she's blended in with the shadow into the wall at the same time that she's out of it. With that photograph, overnight he becomes the, photog the photographer of the dance. He's sought after by Ruth St. Denis, he's sought after, who of course had a school that are, had arisen from the American uh, modern school of dancing. You remember that the original uh, modern school of dancing comes from two American women, one from Chicago, the other one from San Francisco. From Chicago comes Lois Fuller, who arrives in Paris and with her butterfly-like movements with gauzes and a uh, play 
play of lights. She becomes the, the most often uh, repeated model for the Art Nouveau sculpture. And the second one, of course, is Isadora Duncan, who breaks away uh, using the Greek mold. She refuses to, to acknowledge ballet, which she found rigid and unnatural. And the rest of uh, modern ballet arises out of the interest that they have in their contribution. Uh, their, major, um, their major influence, of course, is going to be the Russian ballet, uh, the major foot, uh, choreographer, which will be Michel Fokin. On, in front of you, you will see an older woman, or rather a, a young woman, and a child. This woman is, uh, is Leia Gorska, and the child is her daughter with Nicholas Murai. Nick had fallen madly in love with Desha, and they had a torrid affair, but Desha was really not interested in Nick. Um, Nick was known as a ladies' man, and women adored him, but uh, it was clearly said in one of the profiles done of him by Ursula Peart, who was a major uh, for, um, writer at the time. In her heyday, she had the importance of Scott Fitzgerald in the early 20s, and she writes, Nicholas Muir, there are two kinds of men, one who can give you romantic love and the other one who will make a good husband. Nicholas Mirai belongs to the first kind. Nicholas Mirai will love you in a special way, which is he will treat you as an equal, he will treat you as another person, but he will not be interested in you as a woman. And although the relationship is going to be painful to you because you will be not acknowledged as a woman, uh, in the end it's better because you're acknowledged as a person. Um, Desha decided not to marry Nick, and Nick was inconsolable. She married another dancer, John Myro, and then uh, Nick was inconsolable and was consoled in the arms of Leia, with whom, of course, he had this child. She never asked him to marry, but of course he thought it was the right thing to do. In a sense, even though Nick was so worldly, in another sense he was like a child. He retained an, in a sense, and he thought, well, I have made this woman pregnant, I need to be honorable about it, it's time for me to behave like an adult, I'm going to marry her, I'm going to have a good marriage, and I'm going to raise this child properly. He tried, but of course his heart was not in it, so what happens? In about four or five years, his eyes are beginning to wander, and, um, and Leia says to him, you know, I don't want to be married to you if you do not want to be married to me, you really need to leave. Again, she didn't ask for anything, but again, he had to be accountable, and he took care of her always, even long uh, after, after um, he was divorced. Interestingly so, when he died, he, uh, even though they had been divorced for so many years, he left her a large sum of money in his will. His daughter's name was Arya. It's an interesting name because even though he denied being Jewish and he arrived in the United States where he said, I'm going to be just another person without a history, I'm not going to have a religion, he named her Arya, which means, in Hebrew, it means lioness of God. It seems so odd for somebody who's rejecting his religion to name his child with a Hebrew name. Nick had become the photographer of the dance, and as you notice, once again, his interest in sculpture and in the exotic remains to the forefront of his interest. On the photograph that you see on your left, you see Martha Graham, who was then a student of Ruth St. Denis and Ted Sean. On the right, you see Ted Sean and um, Ruth St. Denis with another two dancers um, um, uh, in the shape of the goddess Parvati. Now, what is interesting that remains is that Nick not only photographed the exotic uh, uh, poses, the w he had a style of doing it. For example, uh, you would come to the studio to be photographed and he would have a record player. In the record player he would play the ballet for which you were performing. And then he would have you perform and in the middle of the ballet he would find some pose that he liked and he would say freeze. 
and then he would take the photograph the way he wanted it. Nick was very interested, more than anything, in the immediate impact of a pose, just like a sculpture. He knew that these photographs were being reproduced. They were re being reproduced in posters, and passers-by would walk by it, and they would say, uh, the, if it was the right photograph, they would buy the ticket to go in. If it was not the right photograph, they would not be interested. Um, everything had to be said with one gesture. Yes, a, word, uh, a photograph is, word, is worth a thousand words, but more important to him than the words were the emotional impact. Uh, having been trained as a sculptor more than anything, of course, and he was interested in photographing the nude body. Interestingly, so again, is that uh, although he photographed so many people nude throughout his lifetime, it was an ongoing uh, joke in the studio. People would say, when a, a beautiful woman would come in, they would say, let's see how long it takes him to take her clothes off this time. And, um, but there was no morbid interest, and this can be seen in, this, in, the, in the photographs that he took. He took equally photographs of men and women nude. This photograph of Martha Graham, these are photographs that nobody has ever seen. They have never been reproduced, they had never been seen in, uh, in a study of Nick Murai. And you see the influence of, um, of uh, German Expressionist and also of the Russian ballet. Here, uh, Martha Graham had photographs taken uh, as Mari Wigman danced. Uh, one of them is upstairs, represented the Baal Shem Tov. And here she is uh, uh, dancing like Nijinsky danced in the Sacred Spring. Um, Many of these photographs remain in his archive and they're still there. Uh, still many have not seen. After he had his first heart attack, many were stolen. Fortunately for us, these remain. Another interesting aspect, you will see the brush stroke above her head. These are, if you wish, uh, tricks that are being used by photographers today. And he was doing this unintentionally in 1920, 21, 22, 23, 25. So in a way, his photographs today are just as new as they were. Uh, in, in even newer than when he made them. Um, in 1925, uh, uh, Michel Fokin and um, and Vera Fokina arrived in the United States, bringing the Russian ballet with him. Fokina, of course, had broken up with Diaghilev because Diaghilev had fallen in love with Nijinsky and, uh, and, um, and um, uh, Fokin was, uh, was ang became angry, decided to leave. You will notice, this is a program for a ballet, and you will notice what is on the upper left. This is the, the announcement for Nicolas Murai studio. And it says, uh, here it says photographs of, uh, of uh, Pavlova, Fokina, Michel Fokin, you know, and uh, others. He had photographed Pavlova, he put, uh, photographed her partner. This is, a, uh, again, a sculptural pose by one of the members of the Russian ballet. His name was Mikhail Morkin. He also took photographs of Morkin nude, but I decided to choose this one. Um, because uh, it, it has uh, a different appeal to me. Uh, Nick Murai was very careful uh, not to photograph uh, genitals, uh, even though sometimes there appears a slight uh, suggestion of pubic hair. He did not like to photograph genitals because he believed that they took attention from the impact that the body would make. He was interested in the tension within the body, what it represented, what it showed us. Um, as the photographer of the dance, he began to be called by everyone. On your left, you see Mr. Benda, who was the creator of masks for, a, for expressionist dances, and he's looking down at uh, Margaret Severn, who began dancing expressionist dances at age 16 by using the masks that Mr. Benda created. Uh, on your left, rather, excuse me, on your right, you will see Ted Sean from the group of uh, Denis Sean. He's dancing Nocien. And uh, this is a photograph that Ted Sean used for 30 years because he was the solo dancer for Gnocien. Nocien comes from the word Gnosis, which means uh, wisdom. And um, Nocien is based on the on um, on the priest uh, in um, in Crete, and from the fresco on the wall of the priest who's carrying the 
uh, uh, the cup. He, out of that, he created uh, this ballet, and again, Nick reproduces him as a sculptor. Um, in 1921, uh, a man arrived at the studio. His name was um, Eddie Bernays. Eddie Bernays was an interesting character. He was tiny, he was small, he was wiry, he was intense, um, um, talked fast, and before you knew it, he talked you into things that you didn't want to be talked into. Eddie Bernays is an interesting character for many reasons. He's essentially unknown, but his work has influenced the whole world. Eddie Bernays uh, had an interesting background. His, um, his father, was brothers with Freud's, Sigmund Freud's wife, and his mother was Freud's sister. Eddie Bernays and his parents arrived in the United States when he was uh, three years old, almost four, and he had two, uh, a toddler and an infant sister that they left in the Freud household. Eddie Bernays was studying agriculture, but bored, uninterested. And before you knew it, he became what is known as the father of advertisement. He arrived at Nick's studio in 1921, and he said, I am representing um, the, uh, ballet, uh, the ballet, and I want you to start photographing the ballet dancers for me. The image that you will see on your left is of Rosa Rolando dancing with Chester Hale in a 1921 ballet. And again, you see the, uh, the sculptural quality and the fascinating with the shapes of the body. The man that you see on the right was actually Pavlova's partner, whom she met in California. He was Hubert Stowitz. Again, you see the element of sculpture, and you see many pieces that are from the Art Nouveau period that look like the sculptures of Nick Mirai. Um, one, of the, one of the dancers that uh, he captured, which I find most fascinating, was Doris Humphrey. Doris Humphrey eventually opened her school. She also arrived out of Denishon. Uh, in, uh, in these two photographs, she represents uh, the ballet called The Spirit of the Sea. The Spirit of the Sea was a ballet which brought a parallel between the power of woman and the power of nature as one and the same. The beckoning calling of woman and the beckoning calling of power. She represents a water sprite in the ocean and she's beckoning a shepherd who sits on a rock and she's making promises of becoming one with him and he's more and more drawn uh, to be one with her but he's afraid until finally she's called him in to his death he dies of course and she does not care at all she has done what she does which is attract and then destroy uh, for her hair, Nick Mirai used uh, strings, which had been painted different shades of green, and the gauzes represent um, seaweed. Nick had a flair about picking up on certain details. As I showed you in the first self-portrait, in which he's standing uh, uh, behind the boat that says prosperity, that one word tells you everything about this person who is standing behind it. In these two photographs, he's also telling you something about each one of the sitters. For example, you know, the woman on the left is actually 15-year-old Claire about. People did not know she was 15. She was supposed to have been 16 when she, when she, um, when she went out to become uh, the, the face of the year. And um, she, everybody knew her as the it girl, but she was peppy and she was fun and she was silly and she was gregarious. But Nick Murak captured her in a completely different mood. Why is that? Uh, in a biography of Claire Bow, I learned that the photograph that Nick took of her in which she looked so sad was taken on the morning after her mother uh, had tried to kill her the previous night. The image that you see on the right was taken for Vanity Fair for, ni for 1924. Um, they had asked him to photograph uh, Charlie Chaplin. By then, Charlie Chaplin was the best known um, actor in the world. Of course, the wealthiest one also. He was a friend of Nick's. He and Nick would go out and 
and, and party sometimes for days in a row. And, but that particular day, he arrives extremely well dressed with a very fine suit. And Nick recalls in his, in his notes from the sitting that um, uh, Charlie Chaplin was laughing, making jokes, being a clown. And he's, Nick says to him, listen, this is a serious uh, photograph. Stand still. So, of course, uh, Charlie Chaplin stands still as you see him here, but he doesn't realize his collar is out. So it didn't matter how serious he wanted to be. He could not help being funny, and so Nick snapped the picture, and this is the picture, of course, for which he's known. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Nick was interested in the effect, in the presence of something. He was fascinated by the creative process, and on your left you see the hand of um, Yasha Heifetz, uh, the violinist, and he was interested to see what he could capture from Heifetz's essence as it came through in the way he played a violin. On the right, on your right, you see the profile. You don't know who it is, but you're fascinated by the silhouette. Uh, the woman is Gertrude Lawrence. She was known for her extraordinary beauty, but he did not want her beauty to distract from her presence, so he makes a silhouette, and here you have it. In 1927, when uh, Babe Ruth earns um, uh, the accolades for having broken all records for um, for um, for home runs, Nick is asked to take a portrait of him. Nick really uh, Nick captures, of course, Babe has the the does has the face uh, of. Um, of a baby, but look at his hands, you know, the power in the hands, and Nick became attracted to that, and that's where he gets the photograph on your right of him holding the hand. Uh, 1929 was an interesting year because Nick was uh, photographing by then not only actors and actresses and personalities from the New York region, but also in Hollywood. He sent to Hollywood to photograph Greta Garbo. He's fascinated by her. He contacts her agent and he says to her, I want her to arrive with a low-cut dress. These photographs were made, uh, were commissioned by Vanity Fair. Greta Garbo instead arrives wearing a man's suit, a man's hat, and uh, without the dress. And Nick looks at her and she says, I'm sorry, but I couldn't find a low-cut dress that, um, I could not find a low-cut dress that, uh, uh, that would fit uh, your request. He says, okay, well, how would you like for me to photograph you? And she says, like this. And he says, okay, I'll take some photographs with your hat on and you can take it off and then you can take your, gradually she began to undress for him. And before you knew it, once again, she was, she was nude, and her agent comes running, Nick, Nick, you can't photograph her like this, but she liked it, and she would not let him interfere. People had a way of trusting Nick, because he could be trusted. It was just as simple as that. He finished the photographs, and uh, when he sent them to Vanity Fair, they rejected them. They found him way too risque. She was much too nude for them and could not reproduce them. Eventually, they, um, um, he was able to sell them to a screen mag uh, yeah, uh, the screen magazine. In 1929, during that same period, it was shortly before uh, the, there's a break because of the stock market uh, crash. Nick is sent to Hollywood to photograph father and son. On your left you have uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and his f new wife, Joan Crawford. He photographs them in front of the ocean right opposite their home on Santa Monica Boulevard, on Santa Monica in California. And Nick, who was a great believer of touching out photographs because he was definite interested in making you look as well as possible, so you would like him, of course. If you notice the photograph of Douglas Fairbanks Jr. on your left, uh, the area of his stomach has been touched up because he had a small roll of skin over the bathing suit. Nick, Nick touched it up. On the left, he catches uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr., who was actually a fencing partner of Nick's, with his wife, Mary Pickford. They are playing um, The Taming of the Shrew. She's playing Caterina, and of course, he plays Petruchio. And why does he wear a hat, uh, a, a shoe as a hat? It's because it's what he uses to beat her with when she doesn't behave, and that's how he makes her, that's how he tames her. 
1926, he photographs uh, Jean Harlow. He's blown away by her beauty and uh, right away you can see how she relaxes for him uh, she can tell that he's attracted to her if you wish in a uh, in a more than erotic way and bends slightly forward for him to photograph her this way there are no other photographs of Jean Harlow like this and before the sitting was over Jean Harlow had invited him to a party have a party tonight she said would you like to come with me but Nick would never say anything else about going to that party. On that same year, he falls in love with the woman that you see on the right. She is Judith Anderson, the Australian actress who had won so many accolades during her lifetime. He, of course, immediately wants to marry her. And nobody knows, but Nick writes a letter to a, um, to a woman who reads the cards and reads the stars to an astrologer, astrologer and says, tell me if the stars are favorable for me to marry her. She writes back and she says, I think Miss Anderson is about to have a horrible year. So if you want to marry her, marry her the year after, but don't marry her now. And uh, he uh, waits a year, uh, asks Judith to marry him, and very politely she says, Nick, I've had all the love affairs I want to have, uh, but if you want me as a friend, you can have as much of my friendship as you wish. And they stayed friends. Eventually, she became the godmother of Nick's daughter, Mimi. Um, 1926, Vanity Fair sends him to Europe to photograph Fenech Molnar, H.G. Wells, uh, George Bernard Shaw, um, and other celebrities, uh, Jean Cocteau in France, and of course Monet. He writes to everyone, everybody writes back, gives him a time when he can come and see them, and of course the only one who does not write back is Monet which is a tragedy for Nick because he adores him. He's one of his heroes and he cannot tolerate the idea of not going to see him. But of course Nick did not know the meaning of the word no. What does he do? He arrives in Paris and says to a friend of his, take me to Giverny. And the friend says, you don't have an invitation. French are very uh, clear about not wanting you in their home if they do not reply to you. He says, take me to Giverny anyway. So takes him to Giverny, rings the doorbell, the maid comes out. I've come to see Mr. Monet, I want to take a photograph. And she says, I'm very sorry, Mr. Monet is very sick. And he says, I have traveled 3,000 miles just to take his picture. She says, oh my, let me see what I can do. She comes back and she said, I'm sorry, Mr. Monet is very sick. And he says, I'm sorry, I cannot leave without his picture, not after traveling 3,000 miles. She says, well, I'll see what I can do. She goes back into the house and she comes back she, she runs back and she says, Mon Mr. Monet will see you, but only for a moment, please. And he says, fine. So he takes many photographs of Monet, many, 10, 15 photographs, from the time that he's walking down with his wife until he arrives at the pond. And uh, by the time he arrives in front of Nick, he says, okay, take my picture. And Nick says, I have already taken them all. He said, but I never heard the shutter. He says, well, this is my trick. I don't have a shutter. That way I can take photographs of you without your knowing it. He says, you have photographed me the way I don't want to be seen, the way I really am. He says, well, and then, but he, he's interested in Nick's um, camera. Nick shows it to him, how they work, and of course has his friend takes a photograph uh, sitting by Monet adoringly. Many times people uh, wonder why Nick did not take photographs outside of the studio. They said his power really lies in the light of the studio and the makeup, and, but it was not true. You can see many photographs that Nick took outside the studio, like for example the one that you have on the right, in which Monet is sitting by the pond with the um, um, with a pergola of, uh, of roses right above him and it really looks like a painting by Monet which is something interesting he took these photographs sent them back to Monet sent obviously many copies to him and Monet sent several back to him signed by him and of course uh, of the of the of the portraits that he took in his lifetime the one that he kept in his living room was one of the portraits that he took of Monet signed to him 
1923, Nick had an extraordinary experience that would be life transforming to him. Through Carl van Vechten, the photographer and also author, he met Mexican wunderkind Miguel Covarrubias. Here you see Nick on your left and you see Covarrubias on the right. Covarrubias was really a genius in many, many ways. He, by the time that he was 16, he had, was also like Nick, truant from school. He also was um, self-educated. He was going to, uh, to cabarets and to bars and to cafes where he would do portraits and caricatures of the patrons and um, he being so young and so much younger than the uh, uh, than the generation of artists that was prominent like Diego Rivera uh, Orozco uh, they would refer to him as the kid and he would do their portraits and their caricatures and of course they loved it by the time that he arrived in New York he was 19 years old he had a, um, a scholarship from the Mexican government for the next six months they were going to pay for him to um, to do work in New York but of course when Carl van Vechten met him and Carl van Vechten knew everybody who was anybody who would be anybody and of course Carl van Vechten was a friend of Nick's he brought him to one of Nick's Wednesday evening studios in the evenings Nick had dancers and other intellectuals come and fencers come to the studio and one of them that he brought was Miguel Covarrubias Miguel Covarrubias was taking New York by storm with his caricatures in the same magazines in which Nick was publishing his photographs Covarrubias was publishing his um his um, his caricatures. He published, uh, he became, uh, again, an, as an amateur still, he, be he wrote the most important book on Bali. He flew to Bali and uh, he, rather he took a trip to Bali and f photographed it and made the ethnographic study that still today remains as a cornerstone of anybody who wants to study Bali. Uh, to go to, uh, on the trip, he took on your right Rosa Covarrubias. Nick had photographed her since 1921, but by, 19, uh, by 1923, when he met uh, Miguel, Miguel eventually, of course, was going to meet Rosa, Rosa and he fall in love, and they marry. Miguel was very important for Nick in many reasons. Not only they were both interested in the dance, they were both interested in exotic cultures, but uh, he introduced Nick to Mexico, and most importantly, uh, he introduced Nick to somebody who at some point would be the love of his life. Um, in the early part of 1931, um, Nick is listening to a lecture by, um, by Edward Steichen, the photographer who had been hired by Vanity Fair, and by then, of course, he was the most important photographer, considered the most important photographer in the world. And Steichen happened to be the mentor for Nick Murai. And he was talking about color photography. He was saying, color photography will not be available for many years. There needs to be still a lot of experimentation. And Nick was listening to me, he was saying, what experimentation? I learned to do this in Germany years ago. So what does he do? He um, takes a boat, goes to Europe, spends the summer in Europe, the early part of the summer, and he buys uh, film, he buys a Jospe camera, and he does carbro photography to do natural color printing. And he begins to write to magazines from the United States and to see which one is interested in doing something in color photography. And the image that you see on your left is the first col natural color photograph advertisement in an American magazine in the May issue of the Ladies Home Journal. In an unusual way, Nick Mura had arrived and admired to where the Ulsteins would have loved it because he was photographing the magazine that the Ulsteins had been mostly impressed by. The image that you see on your right is from the second issue where he published Images in Natural Color, uh, which is called 17 Fashion Models uh, in Bathing Suit in New York. He took uh, uh, advertising uh, by storm. And uh, 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 the reason why he decided to do this is because 
after the stock market crash, people could no longer afford to pay the $4 that he charged or the $2 that he charged for duplicate photography. He said the only people who are going to have money are the people who have money, the people who did not lose it. He said, well, the only way to do it is to recreate myself. So he begins to do natural color photography. And for one photograph, one single photograph in 1931, he's charging $1,000, unheard of. Um, uh, Conde Nast wants to continue getting him to do color photography, but he realized that, that he is not going to pay a thousand dollars. So, so he, f he gets Anton Brühl from Germany to do the color photography, who of course had been trained as Nick had. And he's charging three hundred dollars without knowing that Nick is charging a thousand. On the month in which he publishes the first color, natural color photography, May of 1931, Nick is entering the height of his creative powers. It's the same month in which he is going to meet, um, he's going to meet um, Miguel Covarrubias in Mexico, who is arriving with his wife, a new wife, Rosa, from Bali. Uh, Nick. Uh, by then is married for the third time. He's married with Monica O'Shea, who worked for uh, Walter Thompson, an advertising agency, and they have a horrible relationship, horrible relationship. Nick is ready for a respite. And what does he do? Uh, Miguel says to him, come to Mexico. I'm going to introduce you. You want to see somebody exotic? I'll introduce you to someone exotic. Comes to Mexico, and who does he meet? He meets Frida Kahlo. What was going to be a... Um, a, um, um, a flirt that would not last more than a day or two becomes an affair that would last for the next 10 years and rivets Nick Murai deciding when he m divorces Monique Gaucher that he is going to marry this woman regardless. Uh, of course she had different plans but nevertheless he lives an intense love affair which transforms Nick in many ways. Interestingly when Nick meets Frida, he is entering the height of his creative powers, and she is not known at all. But uh, gradually, in just a matter of two, three years, she will begin to develop the iconography for which she will become famous, photographing her miscarriages, her abortions, her physical ailments, and of course, her sadomasochistic relationship with her husband of two years, Diego Rivera. By 1937, shortly after Nick and Monica divorce, Nick is free to come and go to Mexico openly. And of course, he begins to photograph Frida here in the home of Miguel Covarrubias. You see Miguel on the right, Frida in the center, and Diego Rivera next to Kahlo. Kahlo is simultaneously playing both men against each other. Uh, she touches Rivera who's touching her, who's about to touch her hand, but who she's looking at, she's looking at, uh, at Nicholas Mira. She has been seeing him secretly for several years now because Nick keeps going back to Mexico to see her. Covarrubias is looking at them because he knows exactly what is going on between them, says nothing. And on the photograph on the right, taken in November of 1938, shortly before Kahlo leaves for New York for exhibition. He and Kahlo are the height of their love affair. On the left, you see two models of, um, of Covarrubias. On the top left, you see Alfa Nestrosa, below her, her sister Beta, then Rosa Covarrubias above her. You see Diego Rivera, then you see Miguel Covarrubias, and then you see Frida. And in the center, you see Nick, at his feet, of course, the dog Kaganovich. And when the shutter goes off, who is she looking at? She's looking at Nick. By 1938, late 1938, right before uh, uh, this photograph was taken, she, they ar she arrives in New York to do her exhibition with Julian Levy. And then Nick begins to take some photographs that will become iconic. This photograph he had never developed as it is. He had made a proof with a purple background and that was it. This photograph was found accidentally. I found it by accident in Nick's archives. The, the four plates were in a, were in a shoe box. Um, interestingly so, Frida is having this affair with Nick, but if you notice, uh, wearing um, around her neck are the marriage chains from Guatemala uh, that hang around the neck like a noose.
between 1939 and 1941, Nick believes that he's going to marry Frida. Frida returns from New York. From New York, she flies to Paris to have an exhibition, and from the exhibition, she returns to Mexico. But there has been a problem. What is the problem? The problem is that um, Rosa Covarrubias has discovered, has learned, that Miguel is lovers with a friend of Nick's. Nick and Miguel would exchange girlfriends. Rosa discovers this, and to make Nick pay, he tells, she tells Diego Rivera that Nick is having an affair with Frida. So Frida arrives in Mexico, and Diego Rivera asks her for a divorce. Frida has little to say, but she needs to work, like she always does, under the water. But she has these photographs taken with Nick. You see, she's attached to him, she touches him with her hand. And the photograph that you see on the right is taken probably with a timer. What Nick does is he makes, he draws a square where he's going to edit the photograph. Many of the photographs that it takes between 1939 and 1941 in color are uh, an experiment because at that time it was not popular to, to photograph in color. Nick had learned, had earned um, such reputation in New York that when Kodak was starting to invent a film to reproduce quickly in color, uh, they invented Kodak Color and Ektachrome. But before it was released to the public, uh, Nick Murai was the person asked to test it. So these photographs were taken with, uh, with film that he was testing for, for Kodak. Once again, Nick is always trying to find some parallel, something magical and formative in each photograph. You see the photograph on the left, which is a fascinating photograph to me. Um, uh, he plays with two meanings, the latent content and the overt content. Uh, the overt content uh, is, you see, Frida is holding a m miniature idol from, an Ol an, from the Olmeca region, and she m slightly bends her lips in such a way Nick is trying to suggest a correlation between her pre-Hispanic origins and the relationship with the Olmeca figure. And that's what people usually see. But what people see with the eye of the unconscious is what's on the upper right hand corner, which is the pot made of broken plates. And in the center of it, you see a doll and her body is broken, just like the broken body that Frida Kahlo had. The image that you see on your right, it's an interesting image. You see the earrings that she's wearing are uh, earrings that Kahlo received earlier in that year as a gift from Picasso while she was doing her exhibition in New York. And of course, Nix makes a pun, a visual pun, by place, asking her to place her hand on her chest uh, uh, between the earrings. The photograph that you see on the left is taken by Nick in New York before Carlo leaves for before Carlo leaves for um, for Paris, and he's the boss. He's got the top hat. He's got the gun, and then the year after Carlo and Diego get married, in August, uh, eight months after they're married. Uh, Nick goes to Mexico and photographs Diego. Now he's the boss and Carlo is waiting. Why would Nick go back after Carlo has broken up with him? Well, uh, he has a daughter and she's uh, almost 19 and that's Aria whom we saw earlier. Aria has grown up and become a beautiful young woman. You see her on the left. And here Nick photographs her next to Frida. If you go upstairs, you will see a film. It's an interesting film because it brings together a movie that Nick made. Uh, actually, they're bringing together movies made at two different times. One of them was shortly after Kahlo and Rivera uh, um, uh, get married. And the other one when Aria arrives. It's interesting because Nick is still in love with her and uh, he still photographs her kissing Rivera, which seems like an extraordinary, cruel thing to do to a person, uh, but Carlo did not really care. In this photograph uh, uh, of Aria, she's in Mexico. She went to Mexico to spend um, two months during that summer. Aria wanted to be an artist. 
she was uh, talented and she was skilled and she was working to become what probably would have been a good artist. Um, the previous summer, Nick had sent her to um, Nick had sent her, no, 1939. Nick had sent her to Paris uh, to study painting with her mother, and um, then she'd come back. And now uh, she wanted to send uh, she wanted to send her to Mexico in the summer of 1940 to work with Carlos as an apprentice as well as with Rivera. But during is that summer when Trotsky is murdered. Carlo is hospitalized and Diego Rivera has to escape Mexico, so uh, is unable to take uh, Aria back, which is a tragedy because now that Nick takes Aria to Mexico in the summer of 1941, which is also when he takes the photograph of him with uh, Frida in the studio, um, Aria stays two months in the Hotel San Angelin opposite the um, opposite the house where Diego Rivera lives. Nick takes this photograph in August, the photograph of them together in August of 1941 in her studio. And there are element, elements that are relevant to their relationship. The image that you see on the top left was done in 1931. And unfortunately, you can't see all of it here, but there are two male, under quote, cacti. And you can tell because, um, because of uh, the shadow that they release, and the, one of them is p pointing toward a female one that you know because of the breast that she has above her arms. This painting was exhibited here in the Gelman collection um, some two years ago. Then right below the painting you see a marriage figure of Ixtlán del Río, which appears in a painting by Kahlo uh, from 1940, the year in which Rivera divorced her. In, then you have, of course, Kahlo next to the mirror, suggesting, of course, her forever self-absorption. What Nick has done, once again, is a, do a pun. You have the painting, and if you notice, in her arms, two parrots are together, but on her shoulders, they're apart. Is the before and the after. Notice the, the position of the parrots. One of them is looking toward the other, and the other one is facing forward. What does Carlo do? Uh, what does Nick ask Carlo to do? He asks her to face forward like one parrot, and the other one, he faces, he faces her uh, as he was still in love with her. Nick returns to the United States and gradually, slowly, immediately afterwards, followed by his daughter, who's had an infection in Mexico, she arrives and dies suddenly after two days in the hospital, which may be uh, uh, the most terrible tragedy that have ever happened to Nick, having this 19-year-old daughter die. He never recovers. He does not tolerate the idea of feeling psychologic pain. Nick had this strange belief that of, of mind over body. He could control without, uh, without concern. And of course, that was not true. When Arya dies, Nick begins to develop all sorts of physical problems in his feet. His back begins to ache. He decides he's going to become a, uh, an airline pilot. He begins to, uh, he takes a trainer. He begins to fence four times a week. He exercises all the time. He writes to Frida, says, my body is perfect now. I'm exercising. He denies any kind of psychologic pain. He cannot uh, accept that his daughter has died. And of course, his body, he's always fighting against his body who's sending him messages. You know, you need to feel what you feel. He does not want to do that. He believes he can control his feelings. And at the same time, he's making some of the most extraordinary photographs because still nobody is able to equal the photographs that he does. You see on your, um, uh, he becomes, he gets a 10-year contract with McCall's magazine. On the upper right, you see propaganda for the war. Uh, and then, of course, in the bottom, you see him photographing kittens, uh, act an actress with kittens. Nick was famous not only for photographing food, but also for photographing 
um, animals and children. And they would say, if you want to photograph still lives, you go to Nick. If you want to photograph children, you go to Nick. If you want to photograph animals, you go to Nick. Nick would say in his in his essays on how to photograph in color, he would say, you have only one opportunity to photograph uh, children or to photograph uh, animals. And if you don't take that chance the first time, you're not able to do it anymore because they become frightened. So here you have some of the covers of the magazine that he was doing. By 19, um, um, in, in, when he was involved uh, with his third wife, he works for uh, Walter Thompson, the agency uh, that, is, uh, that represents Camel Cigarettes. And here we have Eddie Burness again. He calls Nick and he says, Nick, I want you to do the advertising for these, uh, for these uh, cigarettes. And Nick, of course, he says, but I want you to write something. And I discovered a letter in the... In the um, uh, New York Times, not the New York Times, sorry, in the Library of Congress, in which Nick says, There's nothing more beautiful than a woman with a cigarette that does not eat a piece of candy. Uh, instead of using a piece of candy, take a cigarette and you will be attractive. This letter, of course, made him infamous. At that time, people say that they did not know that cigarettes were harmful, but it was not true. It was very well known. Yet Eddie Bernays found a way to hire a physician who would advertise and he would say, of course, um, uh, cigarettes are good for your throat. Uh, an opera singer, he would say, of course, cigarettes are good for your throat. And, um, and even though Eddie Bernays' wife was such a heavy smoker that the physician said to her, if you don't stop smoking, I will have to cut your legs off. Nick began to make the most exquisite photographs of his life. Uh, he again, like he learned with the Ulstein, he's discovering, um, he says, you, you show something uh, if you want to sell something else. On the photograph on the left, the exoticism of the Orient, you have a belly dancer uh, uh, trying to sell cigarettes. On the right, you have these belly dancers which are fascinating, this tourists who stare at them dancing on glass and, and, and burning coals, He's selling cigarettes. The interest of these two photographs on the left, of course, it's like a postmodern image. You see on the left, uh, uh, in the room of, um, of, um, of Cleopatra, you see Claudette Colbert, Frederick March, and of course Cecil B. DeMille. And what are they doing in the home of Cleopatra? They're having a Coca-Cola with straws nevertheless. On the image on the right, you have uh, all, this, uh, all the actors in the film with Jean Harlow, Dinner at Eight, and what are they having in the party? They're having a Coca-Cola. Okay. The images that you see on the front, for example, on the, uh, on the left you have an image of a man who appears to be rising out of the water. How did Nick do that? He actually did it with cellophane paper that he would wrinkle and underneath he would put lights in different ways to make it look like water. The image on the left of Marlene Dietrich, he was always careful how to, he contrasted the background and the foreground. And what he did is because Marlene Dietrich had a simple white dress, he wanted to have a colorful background. And he spent much time, if you notice carefully, the edges of her body, both of her arms, are carefully, um, carefully shadowed. So she would look absolutely ravishing uh, with her white skin. Okay. On the left, you have advertisement for shoes for Thomas Kahn, and at the time when he took the photograph on the right of this actress, um, the reviewer said, while the United States is starving and people are taking photographs of the Dust Bowl and all the people who are hungry, Nicholas Mira is making the most gorgeous photographs. Women are more beautiful than they ever could be. Uh, food is more delectable. Men are handsomer and stronger than they ever could be. Uh, an example of how he photographed animals and his still lives. As I said, he was sought after more than anything for photographing food, giving them a spiritual feel to them. Here you see wheat bread. The portrait that he does of Anna Mae Wong on the left, he does that in 1937, the year in which he rebels against the movie industry when they're wanting to do the film based on Pearl Buck, um, uh, The Good Earth. 
and they want her to play the, the, the bad wife, and they want Louise Rayner to play the good wife. And she says, why should I play the bad wife? Why should a white woman play the good wife? Uh, you're stereotyping us, and I refuse to do the movie. Um, and that was, she was the first actor who decided, if you're gonna have somebody black in the film, they should be black. They shouldn't be a white person with the skin painted black. If you're gonna have somebody Chinese, there should be a real Chinese person. The image you see on the right, of course, is the image for propaganda for the war. On the left, you have Elizabeth Taylor uh, advertising for 1948 um, uh, for daddy's little, uh, father's little dividend. She'd already done the father of the bride. I chose a photograph on the right, which is an important photograph in Nick's uh, iconography for a very specif specific reason. This child, the photograph of this child was made for a poster that he made to, against the fight of tuberculosis. And I chose the image because if you notice carefully, the hands of the child are, are dirty, the fingers are dirty, the fingernails are bitten to the quick, just like the doll is dirty. And Nick was so careful about everything being absolutely clean and pristine, but here he really captured the essence of the tragedy of the child with tuberculosis. Nick was a maker of magic. What is Santa Claus going to bring you? He's going to bring you a cup of Maxwell coffee. If you want to buy the most delicious cereal, you're going to buy Kellogg's Rice Krispies. He was such a maker of magic. If you look at the photograph upstairs, you will notice that the, that the uh, cornflakes are actually not falling. He has taken photographs of each one individually and pasted it as if they were falling. In 1955 is um, the last year he goes to Mexico. He spends Christmas like he does every Christmas in the home of the Tamayos. He takes uh, his children. He wants the children to see other worlds. And he wants the children to be exposed to good things, positive things that he did not have a chance to be exposed to when he was a child. During that trip, he photographs Miguel Covarrubias. He does not know that it's Miguel, that is the last photograph he will take of Miguel because Miguel, the next time he he will know about Miguel is that Miguel has died. Uh, the following year he's not able to go to Mexico because he spends nine months traveling around the world doing photographs for, um, for a commission. When he arrives uh, in, in, in early of 1957, in February, he learns that Miguel Covarrubias has died. That's the end of Nicolas Mirai also. He had been attached to Miguel Covarrubias like he had not been to an, any other friend. He, were, he had allowed Miguel Covarrubias to be the only one who knew him. And now that Covarrubias is gone, he, um, uh, the person that, excuse me, his confidant and the person that he trusted the most, um, is no longer there for him. And the very polished veneer of Nicholas Mirai's exterior, exterior begins to crack. And shortly after Miguel uh, dies, he begins to get angrier than usual, more explosive, more irritable, more difficult to work with. His wife tries to soothe him. He pushes her away, does not want to appear weak, crying or suffering. And what happens? He gets his first heart attack. The first of three. The second heart attack that he receives is in, um, is in February 2nd of 1961. He is uh, fencing, and in the New York Athletic Club, he's fencing with Dr. Barry Pariser, and immediately after he finished fencing, he drops dead. He's very lucky because Dr. Pariser gives him mouth to mouth resuscitation and with a jackknife opens his chest and gives him heart massage for the next half hour until he's able to breathe on his own again. Um, Nick lives again until 1965 when he dies for the second time. Once again, he dies with a sword in his hand like he said he would. And the strange thing is he dies once again after a fencing bout. He dies on the same spot uh, where he died the first time. As Nick said, if you're going to do something, you need to do it right. He probably thought the first time he died he didn't do it right. So 
Now he was doing it the correct way when nobody was there to save him. This happened on um, um, on November the second of nineteen of nineteen sixty five, and thus came the end of Nicholas Mirai, uh, master fencer. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Dr. Grimberg, I ha actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, the colors red and yellow seem to be very prominent in most of the color photographs. And in fact, the walls upstairs behind the photographs are very vivid mustard yellow. So I'm wondering if those colors were favorites of his because of Mexico? Or was that more a product of just the color processing at that time? Time. Um, um, I don't think there were a particular uh, personal interest those colors to him. I think first of all I need to answer uh, the first question, which is the bright yellow walls was uh, I think the genial idea of the Pera Museum, which I think ah. it was absolutely. I think it was an intuitive response to the photographs. I think most any other color would not have worked because the yellow uh, is uh, is really complementary to the intensity of the other colors. Um, the reason why the colors upstairs appear to be so intense in the photographs is because of the technique that he used, which he used the carbro technique, which is the only technique that um, presents natural color exactly the way it is. You can put a, a color, a carbro photograph under the sun for 500 years and it will not fade. That's why they look so intense. Um, these photographs are very difficult to make. They're made with four plates of glass, and it takes several hours to um, to um, uh, to actually print the photograph. And it has something between 20 and 30 steps to follow. If you f if you miss one of the steps or you don't do it right, you need to start all over again. Um, uh, the, because the steps are so difficult to follow, that's why people eventually just just gave up doing the doing the carbro, even though carbro gave you much more beautiful images than anything else. But uh, no, they don't have anything to do with his interest in Mexico. Mm -hmm. He was interested in color, but um, it was a personal interest, and I don't know the relationship between the two. If you read the catalog essay, there's an essay by Nick Mira which explains to you why he uses the color that he uses. Mm -hmm. How he mixes them and um, he says how I mix a pink with a green, how I mix a blue uh, with a red. He's always looking for complementary colors. My second question is, um, did you go to Hungary to do any of the research on his early life and if you did, what was that like? I didn't go to Hungary. I, I had the fortune of knowing somebody in Budapest, and um, I, um, I contacted him, and I said, I can't seem to find a birth certificate on Nick. I said, can you help me find one? And he couldn't find one in Zeged anywhere, and I said, and I said well, why don't you try the synagogue? And uh, he found one in the synagogue, and that's how I confirmed that he had been Jewish. Um, and he had been hiding it all his life. He was very frightened that anybody would find out. Um, he left um, escaping like so many of the other people. Um, when his daughter Mimi was going to marry um, a Jewish man, uh, 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 Nick's wife, or her mother, said, I'm sure she knew that Nick was Jewish, but she said, you know, uh, it may not be your interest to marry somebody Jewish because of persecution issues. Um, meaning, that's what she meant. So, Nick pretty much spent most of his life, if I would say all of his life, hiding his Jewish heritage. It's interesting that he died in the New York Athletic Club, which was famous, or rather infamous, for hating Jews, and they adored him. And the photographs of the fencers uh, during the years that he was a member there, that appeared on the wall, every one of them was taken by him. And he died in the New York Athletic Club, 
And on the same spot where he died, there's a plaque commemorating him. He, what Nick really wanted to prove was that you have a value on your own, independently of where you come from or independently of what religion you have. And he believed that in Europe, he was not given that opportunity. He believed by, that by coming to the United States, he could behave as if he had no history. For example, he would, uh, he would forbid his siblings to speak about, uh, about the past or about the homeland to, uh, to his children. He did not want the children to be associated, to associate something that had been so painful to him. I found out accidentally through, a, um, through the daughter of his brother Steve, uh, which made things clear for me, that um, he, um, about the abuse in the hands of a teacher and how he became truant from school. Uh, this I had no idea about. I, you know, I contacted, I spoke to every single person that I could find that knew him, uh, that was alive, and um, and both nieces were very, very forthcoming and very nice and very generous. I found out most of what I found out about the life, and later I discovered things like, you know, his mother had uh, lived in an apartment which was walking distance from from temple where she walked to every Friday, that she kept the Sabbath, that she kept the high holidays that she remained uh, religious till the end. Um, and, um, but I think for Nick that was a source of uh, uneasiness. Um, um, he was very eager wanting to be accepted. As you know, Nick did not finish more than sixth grade. And of course, uh, schools in the Austro-Hungarian Empire were famous for being very good. People went to gymnasium, they went to abitur, and uh, if you got an education in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you got a very good education. And Nick uh, uh, cut it uh, at sixth grade. And then he spent the rest of his life trying to self-educate himself. He was an avid reader, he was an avid student. If you see, if you study his photographs carefully, you know that he knew a very great deal about composition, but in paintings, he knew a great deal about sculpture. For example, his favorite um, painter was Degas, and for several reasons. One of them, of course, you know that Degas was a photographer. Of course, Degas is best known for his, uh, for his photographs of the little rats as dancers, and, um, and of course, the spontaneous compositions. And uh, Nick loved him, absolutely loved him. Um, and he loved him so much that for uh, one year for a Christmas card, he and his partner dressed up as Degas ballerinas, uh, 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 emulating a painting of Degas that today is in the Norton Simon 